things seem to be working. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Robin Grant from Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, where she is a reader in experimental psychology. Uh, comparative physiology and behavior. Oh, comparative physiology and behavior. And Robin and I have been trying to work together for quite some time. Hopefully that will happen uh, in the future. But Robin's interests are incredibly diverse, and that's why I wanted her to come speak today. As you'll see, today's talk is all about whiskers, but she's really interested in them from many different perspectives. So I think that will uh, appeal to uh, many of us. So she's interested in the anatomy, in the um, neuroanatomy, and in the behavior of these animals that use them as well. Um, so I think there should be something for everyone. So with that, I'll hand over to Robin, thanks. Thank you. I'm just um, I'll just get mic'd up for a second. I think I'm on. There you go. That that's, that works. Yes. Um. Perfect. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. Um. Going to tell you about my favourite thing on the world, which is uh, whiskers. So I've been working on whiskers since my PhD. I'm now a reader. I've been here a very long time working on whiskers, and I work on them from a whole host of different perspectives. Uh, my talk title is kind of what can whiskers tell us? Can I change? Just click on it, I think, and then you'll be able to change. Um, yeah. And I also have this aside title, which is from mouse moustaches to walrus whiskers. And it's really to get you thinking about how different whiskers look. Because that's what I'm trying often to understand is how variable whiskers are and why that might be. And if you have a look at these two guys, you can see that they're quite different. So one has very thick, very many whiskers. Uh, one has fewer, but they're beautifully long and they actually move an awful lot. They move them very quickly. My, uh, and so it's just thinking about differences that we see in whiskers and, and why that might be. Overall, I guess, I try to understand how animals move and sense. So I do work on like locomotion or flight as well, but really the majority of my work has been on Facial sensors, so animal whiskers, but also rictal bristles of birds, which are like bird whiskers as well, it's like feather whiskers, I guess. Um, mainly I work on anatomy and behaviour, um, but this is actually quite broad, so it can be moving into things like uh, modelling or mechanics or computer vision to analyse behaviour, so it can kind of vary. Um, Often I work comparatively, which means I travel around uh, different zoos to look at behaviour and, and also go to museums to access different specimens as well. And these are some of the, the types of uh, animals that I work on. So I kind of cross, work across mammals. <clears throat> and the big thing as well is that whiskers are present pretty much everywhere across mammals. There's only a few species that don't have them. So these include some species of cetacean, some species do have whiskers, uh, includes rhinos, includes apes, and it includes apes. Otherwise, all mammals, unless you can think of some exceptions, all mammals have whiskers at some point in their life. So even if they only have them in development, they're present through that time. And the big thing is, is that they do come in lots of different shapes and sizes as well. So whiskers are quite variable and everywhere. But how do they work? What exactly are whiskers? Well, if we just look at them, Gert would have seen this before. This is what I've done with, uh, with, with Gert here at UCL and also um, Jeff, who's at London South Bank University. So we had a look at the shape of whiskers and we looked at lots and lots of different whiskers from lots of different mammals. So we scanned the kind of two dimensional form of the whiskers and we found that they all lay upon this special spiral. So this is the Euler spiral. And what this means is that along the length of the whisker, they can linearly increase in curvature, get more curly. They can linearly decrease in curvature, so actually start off and get straighter, or they can be S-shaped. And 
every whisker that we tested can lie on this spiral. So they all fit on this kind of linear relationship with curvature. It doesn't really matter which species they are. We found that whiskers are pretty much all tapered as well. We find that linear taper, so getting smaller linearly along the length, is quite a good model for taper. But actually, we started to see some quite interesting things now, which we don't know maybe if that is the best model. Um, but on the whole, they're curved and they're, they're tapered hairs. They're thicker than normal hair, aren't they? You've probably seen whiskers on your cat or your rat. They're definitely thicker, um, but they're just hairs. So there's nothing particularly special about the whisker itself. It's a curved um, hair that's a bit tapered, basically made up of dead cells. What's special about the whisker is the innovative follicle that it sits within. So whiskers sit within an amazingly sensitive follicle, so much more sensitive than, say, the hair on our head. The follicle is much more sensitive. It takes information about direction, so how the whisker is deformed, so it will contact something, it will deform, it will take that information about the direction, it will take information about the force, that it's kind of hitting the follicle, if you like that. And also the whisker identification as well. So which whisker was contacted at which time? And just with that information, animals can do one touch and identify something. So they can have, say, one touch against a, a hind limb of a cricket and know exactly where they are on their cricket so they know where to attack. So it's just one touch can give them all of this information. Whisker identification is quite interesting because whiskers aren't just arranged on an animal's face randomly. They're actually arranged into grids, so rows and columns, like a, like a graph. So they have this conserved uh, kind of identification. And actually, that same structure can be found through the brain. So neuroscientists love to study whiskers because they can actually trace a, a, a tweak, say, on this middle whisker here they can find an actual physical structure in brainstem, in thalamus, and in cortex, and trace that signal through the brain, which is quite exciting. We also quite like whiskers because they plug in, so the information travels through the infraorbital nerve to plug into the brain, and what that nerve has to pass through is the infraorbital foramen in the skull. So actually, the size of the infraorbital foramen can be correlated quite, life, uh, quite nicely to kind of whiskeredness. So it's kind of correlated to the number of whiskers and also how sensitive they are as well. So an animal with really, really good touchy-feely whiskers that have lots of them, that hole is going to be really big. So that's quite neat as well. And because we kind of are trying to understand what it is that an animal feels with their whiskers. And we kind of think, well, there must be a reason that they're tapered and there must be a reason um, that they're curved. These must be important parameters. We're starting to try and model these shapes that you get. So trying to think about what parameters are important. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go on. This is like my first foray into mechanical modeling that I'm doing, but um, we're coming to it at the moment. Um, as, a, as an aside as well, we'll come back to this too. This is an amazing whisker. So this is an undulating whisker. So posted seals actually have undulating whiskers. And so they must feel quite different as they move them over surfaces like textures, or maybe they might kind of bend differently depending to a smooth whisker as well. So they're quite exciting whiskers. But whiskers don't just sense. Like most structures that we have, they also move. So this is a wood mouse. He moves his whiskers at about maybe about 12 times per second. So that's really, really fast. A rat will move their whiskers at about eight times per second. Harvest mice can move their whiskers up to 25 times per second. So I'm going to click again. So movement is really important. This whisking is one of the fastest movements that mammals can make. So it's an amazing thing to capture. Because they move their whiskers so fast and like so amazingly precisely, they have this cool network of muscles. So every single whisker has its own muscle. So they have these sling-like muscles that are highly conserved throughout mammals. 
So we see them in marsupials, we see them in rodents, we see them in primates, and um, lots of different animals will have these structural mu uh, muscles. We also have um, ex external muscles to the pad too, and they can translate the pad around. So that means that actually whiskers can bunch up so they can reduce spread. Uh, they can kind of rotate and move up and down. And so they have quite a lot of kind of diversity of movement. There's a lot of complexity in behavior that we can see there. And it's kind of like a parallel to like how we move our fingertips. So we don't just move them backwards and forwards. We actually do lots of complicated things when we sense with our fingertips. And that's kind of what these guys are doing, which we'll, we'll get onto in a bit as well. Because they move so fast, uh, we have to have quite kind of bespoke behavioural setups to cope with it. Uh, we have to have a high speed video camera, especially for recording the small animals who move their whiskers at up to 25 times per second. So, the slowest that we can really record that in a lot of rodents is 500 frames per second, and sometimes it even pays to go higher than that. We also, you can't really see it, but underneath we actually film an infrared. So, we have an infrared light box, which means that we can pretty much film in the dark, which is really, really good because the animals are just a lot more active and a lot more feeling at home and less concerned if we're filming in the dark. The only thing that tends to glow is, is my laptop, really. Otherwise, it's pretty much in the dark. And um, we can do lots of different customised um, arenas as well. So we have lots of different things that we kind of make. So one of our arenas that we've made can systematically and at the same time image footprints and whiskers. So we can look at locomotion and whiskers. And um, so I have something underneath which is called a pedobarograph. So this is something that like sports scientists use quite a lot. And basically it's just like a sheet of glass and around it we have LEDs. And when the animal puts their foot down, it reflects off the foot and it glows. So basically whenever the animal puts their foot down, it just glows. And so that means that we can see exactly where they put their feet. It actually glows more if they have more force. So you can actually do quite um, detailed gait measurements as well. But at the same time, the same camera, we can look at whisker positions and then also foot positions as well, which is really useful if you want to study locomotion. But we can study lots of things. So we can look at open fields, so just having an open arena. We can look at corridors, so sometimes that's quite important. Gap crossing. Because uh, we use the whisk quite a lot for that. I think we've got some videos of that later. Object exploration and also social. So, a lot of animals will actually touch their whiskers together. And so, you can look at these social interactions as well. So, this is a video of a rat which is filmed in our, our local whisk, our Peter Barograph setup. You can see the feet glowing, and then you can also see the whiskers moving as well. So, we can actually at the same time be measuring. Whisker movements and foot movements together, which I was very excited about when we first got this together. Then, though, we have all this video footage, uh, so we do have to track it. So I worked with computer scientists at Manchester Met uh, who helped me make trackers. Unfortunately, a lot of my stuff I still have to manually track because they work comparatively. Uh, and you're going into zoos and environments are quite mucky in zoos and quite difficult. You often are still manually tracking things, but we do have automatic trackers and we're also developing kind of deep lab cut stuff at the moment as well. And um, so this is that automatic tracker which works on rats and mice and a lot of rat and mouse shaped animals. So, you know, shrews and things like that, door mice, it works quite well on. Um, and that's been kind of really helpful for us. So if you say, a lot of my time, a lot of my PhD students' time. Okay, so now we know about whiskers. What do they do? I've kind of probably given a, a few clues. Obviously, therefore, touch sensing, so actually vibratile senses. So investigating objects or, or things are really good for them. And what we basically do is from the trackers, we can get angles. So we track the angle moving forward and moving backwards. So it gets bigger as it moves forward and um, smaller as it moves back. And then using this, we can start to calculate some metrics. We can look at um, things like the angles between the two sides. 
So one thing that we see is that if an, if an animal comes up to an object with the whiskers, that what they'll try and do is they'll make light touches and then also they'll try and contact as many touches as they can. So they don't want to force their whiskers into the object. It's probably, it doesn't feel very nice. So they want to do a light touch and then put lots on. So actually, if you see them kind of around an object, you might see them moving their whiskers asymmetrically to try and get the most out of those contacts. And you can actually see them moving them asynchronously as well. So they're not just whisking like this. They can actually start to decouple them until they come back together. The other thing that we see in order to kind of increase the number of contacts against the surface is that they can bunch them up. So they, in, they decrease the spread of the whiskers, really bunch them up so they can put more contacts onto the surface, which means more information from that surface as well. And there was a reason why I made my uh, local whisk arena. It's also because locomotion and whisking uh, is really important as well. So whiskers are guiding locomotion in a lot of species. And we started to see kind of coupling, I guess, between locomotion and catching. We first started to see it in development, was when we first started to see it. Then we saw that actually, say for instance, when you put a rat in a new arena, they kind of meander around, so they're kind of walking around, and then they move the whiskers quite a lot because they're scanning. But then when they get really used to it and they're just kind of running around, they put their whiskers out in front. And so they don't really use them very much. You've got quite habituated to the arena and they're sprinting around doing stuff. Then they put their whiskers here and they don't really move them very much. And so they're almost like collision detectors, so they don't kind of bang into anything, uh, which is really interesting. When we have a look at lots of different species, so we have a look at dormice and wood mice and harvest mouse and brown rat and water shrew, water vole, guinea pig, we found that in these small quadrupedal animals, that actually everywhere they just scan with their whiskers, they put their forepaws where their whiskers have just scanned. So it seems like their whiskers are guiding safe footballs position. So you can see that's very true in the four paws. So if you look at the kind of blue zone is kind of their mean, and the lighter blue bit is kind of the standard deviation of it all. And in all the species, the four paws land really closely within this whisker field. It's a little bit different when we get onto the hind paws, and they don't always go within the whisker field. And sometimes there's adaptations in the hind limbs like for swimming in the in the more aquatic species that their legs are more splayed and also they tend to often be a little bit bigger at the bum end so sometimes you find that the the uh the paws are just kind of outside of that whisker field that they have so a bit um a bit different there, there so one thing now that we understand whiskers quite a lot and how they move and how they sense is that we can actually start to look at mouse models so we can look at animals that might have sensory or motor disruption and we can start to see if there's a difference in how they move their whiskers um, and so we have made a lot of recommendations for this i have um basically a lab that fits into a suitcase and a tripod and they trundle around visiting people uh, like sam and um, visiting people around and filming their, their mice and rats and gathering lots of data and we've gathered an awful lot of data so we've looked at differences in and found differences, significant differences in different types of whisk movements in Alzheimer's disease, mice with Alzheimer's disease, mice with uh, motor neuron disease, Huntington's, uh, schizophrenia, different developmental disorders, uh, relin, which is kind of a, a, a weird gait thing, as well as a different type of development disorder as well. Um, and so we make kind of recommendations of how people should study whiskers in their mice or their rats. I mean, in the lab, you know, these are quite usual lab animals. They're kind of part of behavior, kind of battery of tests to try and understand maybe, you know, what's wrong with them or how diseases are progressing. And because whiskers are so key for them, this is like they're such an important sense for them. It's so important that we see whether there's a deficit in them. Probably, um, definitely not going to talk to you about all different types of mouse models, but probably one of our nicest stories um, was with Huntington's disease mice. So we worked on this model, which is an R62 mouse. Um, 
And what we saw really closely mimicked what the humans do. And we've only noticed this in the whisker movement in that at 10 weeks, we saw this huge kind of hyper mobile, kind of hyperkinetic stage. So normally they kind of move in their whisker just like this. You know, the controls on one side and you've got the transgenic mice on the other. And as we hit 10 weeks, we end up with this really huge whisker movement. They're fast, they're big, and um, kind of a bit like that hyperkinetic stage that you get in patients as well, but they've got big movements. They get back to kind of normal, and then when they get older, when, they, when the disease has progressed quite a lot, these movements just completely drop off and they hardly do anything at all. And again, this is really mimicking what patients do too. And so this is one of the earliest behavioral phenotypes that people have observed in these mice, which is really exciting that we found it with whiskers. But we have similar stories um, that we've also spotted really early behavioral phenotypes in an Alzheimer's disease mouse as well, which is cool. What's great about it, using whisker filming, is that it's very quick. So it only usually takes about five to 10 minutes per mouse. So you just pop them in an arena and you film them and then you take them out. And there's no training for the animal. Uh, it's in the dark, so they're usually quite comfortable. Uh, it's highly quantitative because we're measuring whisker movements. And we found that it's sensitive enough to pick up sex differences and strain differences and super early symptoms as well. So I think it's, it's quite a promising avenue to um, to explore a bit further. But probably what most of you guys are here for, not rodent models, but to think about other species as well. So working with other species is behaviorally is really challenging. So I'm pootling around to lots of different collections, so lots of different zoos. They're all housed completely differently. The trains completely differently. There's not many of them in each collection because the zoo just wouldn't have, you know, 50 of the same species. That's not really how zoos usually operate. Uh, they come in all different shapes and sizes. You know, I'm filming from a harvest mouth to a seal, and somehow I've got to get something that's kind of representative or comparative between them. Um, it's been quite a mission. <laughs> On the whole, I think we have to be very flexible when we do comparative behavioural work. Um, but I have been designing some things um, to try and get kind of a, at least a workflow of how we might study whisker movements in lots of different mammals, uh, which has been quite exciting. Um, so I have got data from lots of different animals. This is just one of the papers that I have, which is where we went to four different collections to get this many uh, animals, which is really good. Uh, and then I had to do a host of manual and automatic tracking as well, because the automated tracker wouldn't really pick up some of these animals. Also, then you also had, you know, sample size is a bit low sometimes as well. But basically, they were all introduced to the same objects, and we had a look at them. We looked at how they move their whiskers. We looked at these control behaviours that we saw, so whether they can do asymmetric whisking, whether they bunch up their whisker spread and things like this. And actually, some stuff was really cool. Like we found um, that only really the rodents have the, the musculature, but also the behaviour that they can bunch up their whiskers. And no other group seemed to be able to do that. But a lot of things like asymmetry seems to be quite common across all of the mammals, which is quite fun. We can couple this, like I say, with the histology of the muscle. And we can also look back at the measurement of the skull that I said before. So that kind of sensitivity of the infraorbital foramen. And then we can start to think about patterns that we see across different mammals that we work with. Um, and we do see that some animals just have better whiskers than others. And we find especially that nocturnal, arboreal small mammals have really good whisker muscles. They have a lot of whiskers. Their whiskers are very sensitive, so large infraorbital foramen. Kind of smallish diurnal terrestrial muscles and um, mammal, we see that they have less whiskers. They tend to be more disorganized and their muscles tend to be kind of more disorganized as well. We also tend to see often like a, a fortification of muscles around the eye area as well that we don't notice so much in the nocturnal species. And then some species don't really have any whisker muscles at all. And um, it is 
in the prim some primates, but you also see it, I think, in horses and deer as well. They don't have any of these whisker muscles, and they can have very reduced whiskers. So there might only be like a handful of them. You know, if you think you've got a 35 on one cheek here, you might be down to like six or seven in, in some primates. Um, so we can look at the skulls, we can look at the muscles, we can look at the numbers, and um, through this, we start to hypothesize and we can look at the amount they move. And we can start to think that the most sensitive and movable whiskers that I've ever seen are in animals that hunt in the dark. Uh, and it's about kind of foraging and getting around in these dark, complex environments. I see a lot in um, like arboreal species, this kind of 3D environment, and also in, in species that are underwater. So moving around in these three dimensional environments. And I also see enormous inferorbital foramen in tigers and lions as well. So we can start to think about whiskers and what are they for. Uh, so this image here, or this video here, is of uh, a six week old dormouse moving his whiskers. And you can see that he's really using his whiskers to guide those four paw placements, which we did see when we looked at the locomotion arena. But I think this is really true when we look at climbing. So that's when you really see these whiskers come into the fall, kind of sweeping around in front of where they put their feet. So that's a dormant. The other thing I said is that they're good for hunting. We're gonna show you this horror of a video, which is an Etruscan shrew that I filmed in Berlin. They used to keep a lot of Etruscan shrews in Berlin. So this is a very small shrew. It's like the smallest shrew. It's kind of about this big and you can fit it on a teaspoon. Because he's so small, he has to eat a lot of crickets every night. So he needs to be super efficient at catching crickets. Does it all in the dark. So what he does is, using his whiskers, he'll touch the cricket. On one touch, he's able to detect the spines on its back leg. And then it's able to rotate, attack the leg, pull it off so it's disabled. And then it can start to, to attack the thorax. So that's what we're going to see. It's quite quick. It is slowed down by about 25 times, but it's, uh, it is pretty speedy. Okay, it's coming. So he's touching the whiskers, goes for it, pulls off the leg, and then attacks the body. So he does it so incredibly efficiently. If you chop his whiskers off, I haven't done this. That's what they do in Berlin. You chop his whiskers off, then he's um, not able to find the spines on his leg. If you take the spines off the leg of the cricket, then again, they're not able to um, locate the, the leg. They don't, they don't recognize it. So they're not able to attack so efficiently either. So it's there's something about that they're able to recognize from one touch those spines on the back of the leg to know that they're going to put it off uh, and attack. So it seems like they're really important for uh, hunting and for locomotion. What about? The evolution of whiskers. Well, I did tell you that whiskers were everywhere, and they, they really are. <laughs> so they're present really throughout the mammals and um, everywhere. Um, and comparative studies started to say that maybe the first mammals had whiskers because these whiskers are like everywhere. Maybe the first mammals did. And it's not just the whiskers, but the whole musculature. So those kind of individual muscles they're everywhere too and obviously it's really hard to know anything about whiskers because they're not really in the fossil record so we went to have a look at the infraorbital foramen that hole and uh, thinking that maybe if you had a really nice infraorbital foramen nice and big that might mean that you're quite whiskered um, so we can have a look at a few hundred different mammal species and the red dots here they're animals that whisk so whisking is that behavior that we saw in the wood mouse earlier that moved their whiskers backwards and forwards cyclically. That's called whisking. So all these animals that whisk, animals that whisk tend to have larger infraorbital foramen. So animals that whisk tend to probably have more sensitive whiskers. Um, so on this, you can see this is the size of the skull and this is the size of the hole. So they kind of proportion the size of that hole. Uh, and then we had a look at some fossils. I was particularly excited about this fossil here. So this is 
Irmaeus fossil. And I thought, you know, this is like the, the common ancestor of Etherian mammals. And I was like, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be amazing if it had massive like whisker holes and it's going to be in this red section, it's going to whisk, it's going to be amazing. And then there's a really kind of this like black bit here where we've kind of animals that doesn't have great whiskers. So, so maybe not. <laughs> and some of it worked quite well. They kind of some um some synapsids and some therapsids, so very kind of pre-mammal uh, species, you know, before and the ancestors of mammals do have really, really large interorbital foramen. And actually, when you look through them, if you look at papers on them, they say that they're very, very mammal-like. So they look like they might have the same function as we have in mammals today. So actually, people do still think, even though this poor guy probably didn't have very good whiskers, we do still think that maybe the ancestor, the common ancestor of mammals, would have had functional whiskers, uh, which is cool. And this does make sense because the uh, uh, kind of the, a lot of the ancestors of mammals were quite small. They were quite climby. So this is fitting with the patterns that we see where whiskers are useful. Um, probably on the whole, quite quite nocturnal, and they're probably foraging for insects. So they're probably occupying this similar space to where we see animals with pretty good whiskers now. So perhaps uh, the first mammals might have had functional whiskers, maybe not movable, but functional at least. How do whiskers develop? Often we think about evolution and development at the same time. Um, well, they actually develop alongside locomotion. So you can see when you look at um, mice or rats, which is really the only species that we've studied uh, whisker development in. We're going to have a look at some seals quite soon, um, but we've only really ever described it in rats and mice. And um, in fact, when a, when a rat is very small, or a mouse, they have a very big head, like, like our babies, very big head, but they can't really support, so it tends to stay on the ground, and they can't really do much. And what happens is they just roll their head from side to side. They actually have whiskers from when they're born. The whiskers are actually in embryo, is where they are. They're born with whiskers, but nobody ever thought they were functional because they're very small. You can barely see them. But you see them that when they move their head like this, they actually tend to oh, retract the way that they're moving their head towards. So you see these one sided retractions as they move their head. So it's really interesting they're movable. And actually, if you touch them, then they kind of get more excited as well. They actually respond to touch. People think that they're really important for um, finding the mum's nipple for feeding, but also thermoregulation as well. So you can see they're kind of little pinkies. And so the only way that they keep warm is that they kind of huddle together and move around in these huddles. And to do that, it's, it's whisker guided so that they move towards things that are soft and uh, warm and touchy that they can move towards. Um, as they start to support their weight and they start to locomote forward, that's when this whisking appears in rats and mice. So that's when you have this bilateral movement of the whiskers scanning forward, guiding their foot movements that we've seen before. And then when they get really good and they start climbing and doing all this cool stuff, that's when all these big kind of object related behaviors come out. So bunching up with the whiskers, doing asymmetry, asynchrony, all that kind of stuff comes up later. So, like I said, whisk has come before, in rats and mice at least, a lot of other senses. So they're born with their eyes closed, they don't come into play until later. Their ears are actually closed as well and not functional yet, but their whiskers are in place moving and responding to touch too, which is really important. But we don't actually know much about other species and how their whiskers develop at all, um, and you know, there's a lot of variation between newborn species. So this is a newborn guinea pig, which is awful if and looks much like an adult, whereas this would be a newborn rat or mouse, uh, and this would be like a newborn marsupial. So they're all quite different. It'd be really interesting, I think, to study more developmental stuff with whiskers. Another thing that we don't know about is whisker growth very much. We're going to do some work with pinnipeds. Whisker growth is, would be really interesting. So a lot of people use growth and pluck whiskers out of things so that they can study isotopes. So you can do chemical analysis or diet analysis over time with a whisker. 
Um, we know that they grow linearly in rats and mice. They also shed them about say, once a month or something like this. We know that some fields will molt their whiskers about once a year, so it seems quite variable. But then some fields, uh, people say that they don't molt them at all. I'm like, really? I'm like, no, because they have one that's like got a bit of a bent whisker or something's happened to it, and then they just keep that whisker. And so it's very strange, and we don't seem to know very much about it, but we're about to launch a study on the pinnipeds at least, so we can start to have a look through that because that's a, a group that people want to really do isotope analysis on because they're in the sea. And um, I've not spoken about aquatic mammals. I thought I'd leave them to the end and show you lots of like nice seal videos and, you know, finish on seals, shall we? Um, aquatic mammals. So I kind of talked about, about arboreal mammals and in the dark and hunting in the dark. These guys hunting in the dark in a 3D environment, they're just kind of made to have good whiskers, aren't they? They also have a house to like a, a manatee on as well. They also have amazing whiskers. Um, they have about 2,000 whiskers on their faces. And then on their bodies, they also have tactile hair as well. So they have like a whole system for bio tactile system. Um, if we look within the pinnipeds, you can see enormous variation. If you look at just the layout and the number of them, it's also worth mentioning a group that you might not think about whiskers very much at all, and that's the cetaceans, dolphins and whales. So quite a lot of cetaceans actually are born with whiskers. It's only, we think it's only belugas and narwhals that don't have whiskers, but we don't even really know that yet. We see a lot that in when they're very young, they do have whiskers. Some of them will keep them into adulthood. So baby whales, for instance, will keep whiskers and they'll have them around their faces and also around their blowhole and then around their eyes and they still have them. Things like, I don't see, it's like dolphins. You wouldn't expect them to have them, right? Because they're very, very smooth. But actually what we found is they do have whiskers. They can shed them quite early on. Sometimes this means that the whiskers disappear entirely, but sometimes they're actually kept small within the follicle. So people think they might be sensing water movement. But in bottlenose dolphins and in Guiana dolphins, they found that what happens if the whiskers disappear and what, what's left, the follicle, suddenly gets recruited to be an electrosensor. So behaviorally and anatomically, they've confirmed that bottlenose dolphins and Guiana dolphins can do electrosensing with their whiskers, which everyone else is using for fibrotactile sensing, which is uh, really cool, which might mean that other mammals might be doing that too, but we just don't know. Coming back to the pinnipeds, um, their whiskers are great because they come in all shapes and sizes. This is the undulating whisker that I showed you before. So this, this is a harbour seal whisker, which is one of the best undulations I've seen. Something like a grey seal does have undulations too, but they're actually much smaller. This is kind of the biggest amplitude undulations that I've seen. And um, both the both the kind of sea lions, so otterids and phocids, and um, the so seals and sea lions, they have oval whiskers in cross section, which might make them maybe more streamlined in the water. Whereas a walrus has many, many whiskers, but they're all rounded cross section. And um, you can have a look at the infraorbital foramen as well. And walruses have enormous ones. They're basically as big as their eye holes. And their eye orbits. You can see that in there. It's like incredible. They're very, very good. Sea lions probably have the, the largest also overall. They also have the most movable. We do see a pattern as well when we compare, and um, this is representing terrestrial, semi aquatic, and more aquatic animals. We see that in the aquatic mammals, their whiskers tend to be thicker. Sometimes they taper quicker and they're shorter compared to their body size. And we think that maybe that's about them being very thick and very stiff, so that when they're in the water, they're able to position them well, and they don't just kind of get kind of floppy and push back if they were this flexible whisker. Whereas, especially terrestrial animals have very flexible whiskers, especially at that tip that's really short, uh, really thin, and so they really move across different textures. So there's quite different, quite a difference between them. And um, we also know that in pinnipeds, and especially aquatic species, 
that their whiskers are super sensitive. So they're like 10 times more sensitive than the kind of 10 times more nerve, nerves there than, um, than terrestrial species. They're absolutely incredible. We know that they're thick and stiff now. Like in terrestrial species, we know that they guide navigation, hunting, foraging, social interactions. But we didn't really know that much before about how active they were. They didn't whisk, because they're not humans, but we didn't know how active they were. And a lot of people were like, I didn't think they're very active. I think they're just moving their head. Now, what we do with our hands that's really special that humans do, we do something that's called task dependent movement. So if I asked you guys to feel the texture of the table in front of you, you would, on the whole, do this with your hands. Do you try and sweep them across and feel that texture? If I asked you to feel how soft or hard your chair was, you'd probably make this kind of a motion. Uh, if I asked you to measure the size of something, you'd probably feel around the edge of it, or you'd kind of do this and calculate this distance here. So we make different movements, task-specific movements, depending what we want to extract from an object. And so we want to see if pinnipeds could do the same. We picked California sea lions because actually we found that they moved their whiskers the most and had some of the most sensitive whiskers looking at the, the whisker hole. We had three different tasks. And so their job was always to find like the middle thing. Then we had a texture task where they had to find the middle texture thing. So we'd show them them all and they'd have to pick that middle texture. We showed them different sizes and they had to pick the middle size. And then we showed them as a controller brightness task and they had to fit the, the middle brightness as well. Uh, we tracked in two different views, so from the side and from the top as well. We trained quite a few sea lions and it was only low with the sea lion that was good enough to continue with the whole thing um, for a lot of different reasons. We found that California sea lions did make complex task specific movements with their whiskers. So the texture we found that they moved their whiskers across it, making these stroking movements. We found that they felt from edge to edge on the size task. And then when they were doing the visual task, they just didn't really do anything. They went straight to the thing because they could see it. So they didn't really need to use their whiskers. So this is going to be a video of Lowe the Sea Lion using their whiskers, using her whiskers. So California Sea Lion sweeps their whiskers across textures. It's very quick. So they're kind of sweeping them across the textures. When we then get onto the shape, they go from side to side, from side to side, feeling from edge to edge. So this one, this one, this one, this one, the one over there, that's it. And then they just go straight there when they're not using their whiskers and they use their vision. There she is. And we were quite interested in that size task because when it was a big thing, they'd go from edge to edge. But when it was a small thing, they just like stuck their nose on it. I don't know if you noticed that. They didn't really do anything on the small one. They just stick their nose on it. We're like, ah, I wonder how they judge size. If it like us, if we measure the span, if it's something small, so the span of our whiskers, of our hands, sorry, didn't have whiskers. And then we were like, hmm, maybe they would go like this. And they could measure the span of their whiskers. That would be really cool. So we uh, had a look at this. So we had a two alternative fourth choice test. So they, we had a seal, and one seal had to always find the biggest thing that we gave them, and one seal always had to find the smallest thing. And so they'd explore both sides and then show over the one that they had chosen as their, their big or small, their target thing that they were doing. This is Mo, the seal, father seal here, um, and that's me doing the training now. So, uh, that a while ago. so this is Mo, so she gets her. Um, Flying fold on, so she's definitely only using her whiskers. Take her whiskers out because it'd be no good if they're left behind. And um, so we didn't give anything away with secondary cues. We also put headphones on it. We put in different sizes. So we have a smaller one here and a big one here. And Mo's going to find the big one over this side. Someone's actually signaling to me what I'm meant to be doing here. Okay, so we send her down. We tell her to go, she goes right and left, pushes it over, she makes her decision in like under a second, and then she gets lots of fish. And she carries on and she does this about 40 times in a day and just uh, loves to do it. 
And when we had a look, it was nothing to do with whiskers fan at all. That didn't work. What they just do is that they orient, they orient to this high resolution area where you get lots of small dense whiskers. And they stick their nose on right here. So they'll kind of touch and then orient. And then what we think is a very quick calculation of how many whiskers they're touching. So I think that's what they do on small things. Then when you get quite wide things, and that's when you probably have to feel edge to edge. So we're actually probably doing quite different, different things, which is quite fun. And so overall, we think that whiskers are a super important scent in many animals. And really important animals are wandering around in the dark. And they sense, they move, but also they're really important for, say, perception. We just talked about kind of active control for sensing with feedback, but also for memory, for attention, for cognition. That's why they're really important in our mouse model work as well. So there's lots of applications for this work. And there's kind of a couple of things that I work on, I guess. So one is thinking about enrichment and welfare. So um, I guess the way was going to do a lot of my experiments in zoos because I'm like, it's enriching the animals. And it is, they really enjoy exploring stuff with their whiskers. They really like that. And um, so this was a task I was doing most of this summer, actually. This is getting down to the Wildwood Trust in Kent and giving otters and foxes uh, different texture tasks. And so this is like a, an enrichment task that you might have with your dog or your cat when you give them a little puzzle and they you hide food under a certain texture. And so this is what we trained with the otter and the foxes did learn it. That was a lot of my summer, but the, but the otters did learn it. Um, we've also tried uh, feeding, so kind of moving feeding. We can't feed animals live animals, not allowed, but you can maybe enrich how they're being fed. So kind of doing like active feeding tasks with the keepers sometimes helps. And you do see these with movement following the food as well. This gives them different objects, also makes them move their whiskers more, which is quite cool. And doing, I know this seems a bit showy, but also doing things like this, like ball balancing for animals that can do it, is amazing kind of workout for their whiskers. You can see that they move their whiskers, that the ball starts to roll, they move their whiskers and they correct with their head. So it all seems to be like sensory guided movement as the ball moves. Also, as well, we went with people designing tactile robots. And so this is Scratchbot, which is when they went on quite well. I actually started working on Whistlebot when I was doing my PhD. This is um, Scratchbot, who, who we work with. This is Shrewbot, who is like the Etruscan shrew tracing his little cricket. And um, so we also work, yeah, mainly with Bristol Robotics Lab, but we also have kind of some robot arms and um, robot sensors also in our lab too. So whiskers are super important. Sense and move, useful for measuring rodent models as well as in other animals too. And they're indicators of health and welfare perhaps. So enrichment might be useful. So if we go back to these guys, which was the first question that we kind of had, we see that the mouse has long, slender, flexible whiskers because it's terrestrial, big, large muscles, really regular muscles, really regularly arranged whiskers, super mobile whiskers, using them for foraging and hunting, locomotion, especially in these dark, complex habitats that it lives in. Uh, walruses, on the other hand, thicker, stiffer, Loads of them, big muscles, <laughs> more sensitive because it's this aquatic animal, less mobile, we just seem to see that. Foraging, it actually uses them like brush on the bottom of the sea. Uh, and also it uses them to like guide head movements as well. So uh, as it moves its head, its whiskers move ahead of a head turn to kind of explore where it's going as well. Um, so yeah, that's it really from me. And thank you to everyone uh, who helps me. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the couple of questions. Um, that's very curious about the differences with less of the sir. Is there much known about how Established or 
question to repeat. Oh, yeah. So just to repeat, um, so the grid is really interesting. It's super interesting. And do we know about how that grid pattern is laid down in development? Um, so the answer is not loads. <laughs> Weirdly, we do know that, say, if you... I think the, the pattern on the face comes first, and then I think the brain gets wired in. So people have done experiments where they've added whiskers in or taken whiskers out, and then the brain uh, topology has, has changed, topography has changed in response to that. So you can actually add structures or remove structures in the brain. So I think it's the, the face seems the most important. I think that there's a bit of an, a split between the top and the bottom as well. So the bottom rows are very, very regular and seem to come in first. And then the top rows seem to be a little less regular and they come in a little bit later in embryo. Um, but I don't know what it is that like makes them. <laughs> yes, so the question is, is there a difference in innovation between the intrinsics and the extrinsics? Yes, I think so. The muscle fiber types are also quite different as well. And so in mice and rats, which is the only ones that have been studied, the intrinsics have lots of fast muscle fibers and they have a lot more um, innovation into the muscles um, and less so in the extrinsic muscles um, to even go in the cervix. Which nerve is supplied by the same kind of nerve? Think so. I think they are. <laughs> I think so. Um, facial nerves, yes. So um they comes from the facial nucleus and then there's a motor output into a facial. That was great, thanks. Um, that's a question. Um, but you said that obviously there's only people that don't have to. Why do you think that might be kind of now that you know just how useful they are, but that also needs to like why is it that some just lost Yeah, so the question is why have some mums lost their whiskers entirely? So the, the usual question I have actually is uh, why us, why primates? And I think that's an easier question to answer because you know you have um uh, that we are more upright, so you're not guiding a locomotion. We have amazing hands, uh, our vision is fantastic, and all of these probably makes, makes them you know not that useful. But when you're getting on to say why rhinos, I mean I guess they have this super movable uh, tactile lip, but so do other things like horses, but horses do have very small whiskers and they don't have the muscles. So maybe maybe something to do with the lip might kind of replace the whisker sense. Um, and then when you get onto say um, a narwhal or a beluga, I have no idea why they wouldn't compared to something else. So I think differently, I think it's probably quite a nice pattern in primates, but I think, and I bet there's probably other animals that don't have whiskers that we haven't described, that we don't know yet. Yeah, um, what you ask your question, we'll go to that. Um, whiskers ever used Yeah, so um, question is, are whiskers ever used in communication? So sometimes, especially like for pain scales and um, for welfare, um, or sometimes for um, expression stuff, you can see that with whiskers or any cats have some with it come out and then you get these grimmer scales that you can see certain things with whiskers. Often what you have is this kind of tactile communication. So like in uh, mice, they found that you have um, like super tactile mice and some that aren't. So you have really touchy feely mice that like to touch others a lot and then other mice that don't really touch others very much. So actually this tactile contact is quite important. And you see it an awful lot in um, young and mum so that's quite a, an important contact you'll get this whisker whisker contact but also whisker body contact as well 
there's a question behind you on the chat. Has any work been done on the relationship to place or groups or groups? Ah, yes. Um, I did talk to someone about this recently. Um, let me try and remember. Uh, I think that that whiskers can feed into um, these location maps. So I think, you know, it's whisker and visual information that can help us make this map. Um, so I think that they are feeding into them. And I did have um, a conversation, something about uh, like edge cells as well. And then as you get close to that edge, because you'd end up with a whisker contact too. So that's probably feeding into these kind of edge recognition things as well. The way I think so. Right. Um, I saw in the more previous video I said that we're also now showing where they are different. So where did you find it? Um, ah, yes. Maybe we can get back so I can remind myself. Sorry. The silly question is um, was in where did you layer fall on the graph? Because I did color code them. Good spot to be nocturnal. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, so, yes, we were color coded into nocturnal, uh, which is the kind of filled in state of coming into our nocturnal area. We also found that all the um, uh, whisking things were basically and um, were all nocturnal as well, and the majority of them were arboreal too. They there to sing, yeah, he, at least he's sitting in this kind of nocturnal space. Yeah. I wonder if, there's, if there is a difference in the schedule. I mentioned horses, for example, is there a difference between, say, herbivores and insects, horses, insects, animals, like that? Yes, I think so. I think that as soon as we get into herbivores, we I feel like we're seeing that they're less sensitive. You then get that some of these muscles are reducing and even disappearing in some species. The risk of numbers are smaller, we don't really use them as much. So I think it is very important. We have done some behavioral studies with horses, and um, because you used to um because you chop their whiskers off to keep them looking nice. It was just to, to, just to, to look nice. And as you found that when the whiskers were on, they, you could see them touching down before they ate. So they would judge the position of the head and the knee. And then as soon as you chop them off, they'd kind of <laughs> bang into the surface before they... And they, they would get over it quite quickly and then they didn't have their whiskers. But you can see that they would use them if they did have whiskers. So just very, very close proximal fences, I think, rather than guiding any impact. When you look at the information to be this thing and your motion, if I understand correctly, it's not drawn to the jar. Um, do you think there'd be a difference or, or, or try this in the, in the light in terms of like, do they change the way they use the whiskers in relation to the locomotion if they also have visual input where? Yeah, so we have done it in both actually, just because it took a while before I could get an infrared light box. So we do have a lot of data from the light as well. Um, I haven't seen a very big difference in the relationship between how they move. I think sometimes you can see like slightly more whisker movements or something like that, but I wouldn't really see any difference between maybe like, coupling the screen locomotion and whisking. So um, really, like even if you put the light on when they're moving around, it's like it wouldn't really, you wouldn't notice anything different. There might be tiny differences that I pick up when I track, but otherwise, yeah, I do think so. Just wondering, um, I don't remember the dog or cat, see her hair and uh, eyebrows as well, and maybe the lower jaw as well. Is that the equivalent of the whisker? And then Cutting through the improper or improper or the frontal. 
Yes, so, um, sorry, then, so I forgot to repeat some of my questions. And um, so the question was kind of the, the eyebrow whiskers and the, the trident, which is under the chin, kind of how do they work and kind of where they plug in? So I think they do kind of plug into slightly different areas. I don't know about the trident, whether that would come up to here. Functionally, they do quite different things. So um, people think that the um, eyebrow kind of whiskers uh, are to do with detecting like wind and movement. So it might be to judge their own speed and orientation. And then the trident ones are quite useful for um, uh, kind of for locomotion too. So they use them to touch sporadically on the floor. They're, they're both not movable that we know of. Um, there is another set of whiskers here, which come behind. You see them a lot in, um, not all species, you don't really get them in rodents so much, but you see them in the mustelids, the otters have them here, and marsupials do, so the genal whiskers, so proper cheek whiskers. And I've seen muscle slings around them that go back into here, but I don't know if I'm convinced whether I've seen them move or not, and I'm not sure, and it's very difficult because they're all like moving when they walk, so you kind of get this flap, but I don't think I really see them move, even though they do have sling muscles. Yeah, so the question is, is there a difference in like the, uh, the predation type, so whether there's like ambush predators or non-ambush predators and how sensitive the whiskers are? I don't think anyone's done that. So I think in the pinnipeds, we made some very, uh, yeah, very big comments about maybe, yeah, inducing stuff. They might have more sensitive whiskers, but I don't think anyone's ever looked at it systematically. But I think with some of the data sets we have, I think it could be a good thing to do. Might need to collect some more predator stuff. <laughs> Yes, so um, the question is, uh, is there a function for the uh, undulations of the whiskers? Get one of the things. They are really cool. Um, so we, it is very strange that we only see them. Yeah, here's one. That it is very strange that we do only see them in photon seals. So I don't, I don't really know why they're only in photon. But they have been studied quite a lot, not by me because it's hydrodynamics. So that's very complicated. Um, but they're meant to be really, really good. That they um, basically uh, uh, reduce the signal to noise ratio as they're moving through the water. So it means that they're kind of extra stable in the water and extra able to pick up these external stimuli. So they are incredibly sensitive for hydrodynamic sensing. So that's something I didn't really mention in my talk, is that seals and sea lions, they're not just touch sensing, vibrotactile, so it's vibrations in the water. And that we've worked with the harbor seals and we, um, we're training them to detect hydrodynamic signals. And we're trying to make, trying to work out how sensitive they were and we couldn't make a small enough signal. They could always detect whatever signal that we gave them. We couldn't make a small enough signal for them. So they are absolutely incredible. And yet this cancellation of, of noise from their surroundings to pick up the information that they need. Yeah, so um, question is, have I done much work on burrowing mammals compared to um, non-burrowing? And it's a really good question, especially for the early mammal stuff. You can get a lot of, of burrowers and early mammals. I guess I haven't, and it's mainly because they have amazing whiskers. And uh, so they're present. You see them, um, so even like a star nose long has the star, and you see um, whiskers ahead of them. But how is them often not very movable? So because I've been exploring a lot between sensing and moving, I've kind of moved towards these animals with very mobile whiskers. And on the whole, I feel like they're not very movable, which is why I haven't focused on them so far. But I think they would be a really interesting route to look at. Um, 
The question is, goodness, isn't it a lot of sensory overload when a when an animal swims through the water there? It's because they're constantly taking on this information. I guess in when we've kind of modeled stuff before, especially in our robots, we have like a cerebellar model, which basically kind of cancels out, it's like a noise cancellation, so that you focus only on the things that are important. So for instance, if you move your head, you can kind of take that out. If you move forward, you can kind of cancel that out. So probably, I think it's it's kind of maybe that it's our abundance in this kind of cancellation uh, thing, but I do think it's an incredibly noisy environment. And I think it's also really interesting to know, I, I, I'm trying to understand, I wonder what the difference is from, uh, from say a, a, a hydrodynamic signal to a tactile signal. And how they might tell the difference that this is a really big signal far away, but this is a really light signal that's actually touching me. And then I do see with this seal from sea lions that they really squish their whiskers on stuff. Whereas I feel terrestrial animals do these super light, sweepy touches. And it might be that where they're like, is it, is it this or is it a, a hydrodynamic signal? So it's something that we really, really want to explore. And I have put grants on it, but I haven't got them yet. Uh, to make these, um, yeah, to make computational models and also look behaviorally, to try and understand how you might noise, especially your self-generated noise. And then also um, to think about hydrodynamics versus tactile sense as well. Yeah, cool question. Well, thank you very much, Robin. That's been a great yeah. talk. Um, such a comprehensive look through whiskers. Thank you. <laughs>